the freezing temperatures of the Arctic Circle, intense off-road driving and the searing heat of the Sahara Desert, not to mention wild animals that are ready to pounce without warning. That's what a journey of a giant block of ice looked like. The thing was moved from the Arctic Circle all the way to the scorching equator in the back of a pickup truck. Rewind back to 1959, when the world was going through some tough times and a cola cost you a nickel. Radio Luxembourg presented its listeners with a challenge. It was to transport three tons of ice from the Arctic Circle to the equator. Anyone could take part in this adventure. The only condition, and a tough one at that, was that no refrigerator could be used throughout the journey. To make things even spicier, they offered a reward for those who could do it. A whopping 50,000 francs for each pound of ice that remained at the end of the journey, which would be around $9,000 per pound these days. And if someone managed to deliver the entire block, they could get around $50 million. As soon as the challenge was announced, the guys from the radio just kicked back and waited for the laughs to pour in. But Burrier Notvik wasn't laughing. At that time, he needed money to develop his business, which was manufacturing glass wool insulation. If the man succeeded, he could help his family and employees. So his company, Glossvat, based in Norway, took on the challenge and surprised everyone around, especially the radio station. It seemed to be an impossible task. No one had ever accomplished such a feat. The total distance was around 5,000 miles, all in the boiling sun. It would probably melt the entire ice block even before it reached the shores of Europe. But Burrier was a smart man and had a brilliant plan up his sleeve. The radio company figured out what the man was going to do. They realized how much they would lose if he were to succeed. The result? They canceled the entire money reward. When Burrier heard of the news, he was at a loss. He'd already gone to the Arctic Circle and prepared to excavate some ice. Luckily, before he knew it, the situation gathered so much media attention that sponsors from eight different countries lined up to support Notvik's journey. Famous petrol company Shell provided his expedition with fuel, and transport manufacturer Scania gave them a pickup truck. Burrier Notvik and his team started to cut through ice. Of course, they couldn't get a single piece that would weigh three tons. That's why they chopped up several 450-pound blocks of ice. And then they transported all those pieces by helicopter to the town center. Then they melted them together to create a giant chunk of ice. After that, the ice was supposed to be placed in the back of a large pickup truck. But it wasn't enough to prevent mm. it from melting and the team couldn't use any methods of refrigeration. Burrier decided to put the ice in a specially constructed iron container, insulated with glass wool and wood. It would keep the ice more or less intact without breaking the rules of the challenge. It was a very clever way of insulating. Glass wool is made of melted glass fibers. The air gets trapped between the thin glass strands and can't flow out. This way, there are no dramatic temperature changes. Along with the massive chunk of ice, the truck also carried around 650 pounds of medicines. They had to be delivered to a hospital that was on the way of the expedition. On February 22, 1959, the epic journey across the continents began. It started in Norway. Then the team traveled through Copenhagen, Hamburg, Brussels, Paris, and Marseille. In Europe, almost everyone knew about the unusual journey. Notvik and his people were greeted with cheers and claps as they drove through large cities and small towns. The roads were well paved and weather conditions didn't bring any problems. News spread even further south when the expedition reached Paris. By that time, they'd already become celebrities. The police even escorted them through some of the busiest streets to make way for the truck carrying the ice. The mayor invited Burrier and his team for lunch. The ice was in good condition until it arrived at the port of Marseille. That's when things started to look challenging. The team had to use a crane to lift the pickup truck 
and load it on the ship. It was supposed to take them to the coast of Algeria. Notvik and his people realized they were about to start the most difficult part of the trip. Bye-bye to the cool landscapes of Europe. They'd have to endure the scorching sun of the desert before being able to finish their trip. Soon enough, they were on their way to the final destination. But the ice was melting away much faster than before. That's why the expedition had to move at an ever-increasing speed. But it turned out to be challenging. It was almost impossible not to get stuck in the sand. At that time, the Sahara had no paved roads for miles on end. So, Burrier and his crew had to dig their heavily loaded car out of the sand in the scorching sun. Every day, the temperatures got higher and higher. Sometimes, it was hotter than 120 degrees Fahrenheit. The truck got stuck more and more often. The ice was melting faster than before. It seemed to be just a matter of time before all they were transporting across the Sahara was a large swimming pool filled with cool water. And still, no one was ready to give up and to go back home. They made camps in the desert during the nights and kept driving during the days. The finish line was right there. They came across many friendly nomadic tribes that were traveling on camels' backs. These desert dwellers helped the expedition with some food. In return, the crew offered them the most unique water the locals would ever have, melted ice from the Arctic. Nomads know how to survive the extreme temperatures of the Sahara Desert. They're accustomed to such an unusual lifestyle. But they would have tough times without camels. Often called the ships of the desert, these unique animals store fat in their humps. When camels can't find any food or water in the desert, they turn this fat into energy. Anyway, after many days under the burning sun, Notvik and his people finally left the desert and entered the jungle of Gabon. Soon, they reached Libreville, their final destination. Many locals gathered around to witness history in the making and one of the most bizarre road trips ever. The ice was still in one piece, Burrier and his crew were in one piece, and it only took them 27 days to get from Norway to Libreville. <laughs> Not bad. But the main question was how much ice had melted away? They weighed it and did all the necessary calculations, and then their jaws dropped. At the beginning of their journey, the weight of the ice block was 6,700 pounds, but now the ice measured to be 6,000 pounds, which meant that only around 700 pounds of ice had melted away, even after it had traveled halfway across the world through different countries and different climates. The whole world was shocked to find out about the outcome mm. of the expedition. Apparently, if you transported a giant block of ice from the Arctic Circle to the equator, you'd only lose 11% of that ice along the way. Notvik gave most of the ice to the locals. These people had never seen or touched frozen water before. The rest of the ice was flown back home to Norway. It was then used for the drinks at numerous press conferences. The return journey was much easier. The members of the expedition simply flew back by plane. Charles de Gaulle, the president of France at that time, offered to personally greet them in Paris if they drove back by truck. But the exhausted team declined. Nothing would make them drive through the desert again. The journey was a success, even though there was no reward money for the challenge. The expedition reached its goal, and Burrier attracted worldwide attention to his company and its products. Yep, I think it's safe to say that falling from any height can be really dangerous, but especially when you've tumbled out of an airplane, and worse, without a parachute. Now, the trick here is to create drag to slow your descent. Use your shirt, pants, or do an air snow angel. Anything to slow you down a little bit. But hey, you've always wanted to make an impact, right? Well, check this out. A Yugoslavian woman was working as a flight attendant. She survived an incredible fall on January 26, 1972, after the plane she was working on exploded. Falling from a height of 33,000 feet, she managed to survive but spent the next year and a half recovering after waking up from her coma. Experts disagree on the right way to land, but there's definitely a wrong way – landing on your head. 
Do you remember the rule of three for us squishy human beings? Uh, that's you and me, by the way. Three minutes without oxygen, three days without water, three weeks without food. It's a great guideline, but some people manage to stretch it out a bit further. If watching a sunset, smelling flowers, or ordering that big juicy hamburger is important to you, well, you'd better start thanking that delightful gas, oxygen. Don't believe me? Try doing even one of those things without it. Two minutes without oxygen will cause the average human to pass out. After 10 minutes, well, there isn't usually a comeback to her. This varies, of course, from person to person, depending on their fitness levels. But we love to push the boundaries as humans, don't we? The longest someone held their breath for was an outstanding 24 minutes, 3.45 seconds, give or take. That's 100 times longer than the first airplane flight. Take that, right, brothers? Alex Segura Vendrell from Spain pushed the limits of breath holding in 2016 by floating in a controlled pool environment. Just before going under, he was gulping in air like a fish to try to get as much oxygen as possible. Strangely, holding your breath underwater is easier than trying it on dry land. Swimming activates your diver's reflex, slowing down our heart rate and metabolism. Not only is oxygen important, so is precious H2O, a hand-tasty food. Each cell in our body needs water to survive. If we can't replace the water loss quickly, we only have about three days to a week before it's all over. How humid the air is, our age, physical activity, and health play a huge part in water retention in our bodies. When we're running low on water, the important areas of our body, like the heart and brain, pull water from wherever it can. Like a sponge, these organs soak up everything until there's nothing left. In 1979, an Austrian man in a holding cell lasted 18 days without water. He allegedly licked condensation off the prison walls to stay hydrated. What's the scariest thing in the universe? The fridge is empty! Where's all the food? <laughs> without any calories, your body starts to feed on itself. Not exactly the diet I had planned for this year. During the first few days, our carbohydrate reserves are turned into glucose. When that's all used up, our body starts to target fat, muscle, and other proteins, all the way down to the bones. Fasting is a common way to let our bodies use those extra reserves inside of us. Mahatma Gandhi's longest of many fasts lasted 21 days. The longest known fast was when a 27-year-old lived off water and vitamin supplements for 382 days and shrank from 456 to 180 pounds. Yow! Our bodies are equipped to survive without food for long periods. Our ancestors didn't exactly have a supermarket to go to. This makes us pretty good at dealing with starvation. We humans can cope with many extreme survival situations. But how long can you swim in freezing water without turning into a popsicle? What happens if you're stuck in the desert or at the top of a mountain? Climbing the peaks of the world, like the Rocky Mountains, the Swiss Alps, or even Mount Everest, is challenging on a good day. But the real danger is altitude sickness. It affects about half of all climbers. Starting at roughly one and a half miles up, the lack of oxygen can cause dizziness, tiredness, and headaches for some. Others can even get insomnia. This is just the start of a whole bunch of symptoms that affect our bodies. Consciousness becomes a big problem for most people at 3 miles up without proper preparation. Ascending too quickly can even lead to fluid in your lungs or even worse. The thing about altitude sickness is that it doesn't care if you're old or young, male or female, a couch potato or an athlete. Everest is 5.5 miles high and the ultimate challenge for climbers. It's like hiking up 20 Empire State Buildings or two times the Hollywood Walk of Fame. Austrian Felix Baumgartner pushed the altitude tolerance limit on October 14, 2012. He jumped from 128,000 feet up. That's nearly 24 miles. It's no surprise that he's also the first skydiver to go faster than the speed of sound, reaching a mind-boggling 833 miles per hour. He definitely had the right equipment, like a pressure suit with oxygen and safety checks in place, which goes to show you, if you're going up high, remember the five Ps. 
proper planning prevents poor performance. Surviving extreme heat isn't just about the temperature. Humidity is the real danger to us. The less humid the air is, the more water stays where it belongs, in our body. Ever walked into the sauna and realized that it's over 230 degrees? That's so hot and humid, you'd probably only last about 3 to 4 minutes max. Wait, humans can't melt, right? Above 104 degrees, there's a real chance of heat stroke. It doesn't sound like a big change from our usual body temperature, but it is. Just imagine getting caught in a desert for a few days. And not just any desert, the world's hottest. The hottest temperature ever recorded on Earth was in Nevada, a crazy 134 degrees. Cooling way down really quickly can help relieve cramps, headaches, and even nausea. But breathing can become kind of impossible once your organs start to shut down and hypothermia sets in. As soon as our bodies drop below our natural body temperature, our muscles start to stiffen. That's why you stop feeling cold and pain after a while. There just aren't any nerve endings functioning anymore. Shivering quickly to produce heat is our body's natural way to keep our organs warm. This only works for cold air, though. In cold water, shivering drains your body heat even faster. If you've never heard of the 300 Club, you're not alone. A base in Antarctica has found a great way to test the extreme limits of the human body in the most peculiar way. Participants at the station warm up in the sauna, which is heated to 200 degrees. Then they pull on their boots and run outside, where it's minus 100. Not only do they have to endure the 300-degree temperature change, But they've also got to run around the South Pole before coming back to the sauna to warm up again. Oh, am I tired? Time for a little snooze. Sleep is very important. Maybe that's why getting out of bed in the morning is so tough. We need sleep to recharge our body from the long day we've just had, leaving us refreshed and alert when we hear that alarm. Our brain can turn all fuzzy without enough sleep, and a good 8 hours is perfect for a healthy immune system. Sleeping improves our memory, our heart, and puts us in a better mood for the day. Randy Gardner and his friends tried to test the limits of staying awake. It was for their science fair project. They managed to stay awake and functioning for 11 days and 25 minutes. Even when tested during and after the experiment, Randy could play basketball and had no abnormal brainwaves. Now, it's almost impossible to calculate the exact g-force that would harm a human. That's because there are three types of g-force out there – side to side, up and down, and forward and backward. The danger lies in how long we have to sit there while we're being thrown around like a rag doll. The longer we sit there, the more it affects our bodies. We experience g-force at home simply by sitting down on the couch too quickly, sneezing, or having someone slap our back a little too hard. Pilot John Stapp demonstrated that a human can withstand over 40 Gs. That's nearly 10 times the amount an average racing driver feels. The experiment only went on for a few seconds. But for an instant, his body weighed almost 7,000 pounds. Survival isn't always about taking on the elements. Sometimes, it's fighting against time. The current record for the longest living human is Gene Kalman, who was born in 1875. Millions of people around the world go out on the streets and rooftops to look at the amazing cosmic phenomenon. Another planet right next to the moon, a big red one. At first, everyone's excited. Mars showing up out of nowhere is having a strange effect on humanity. Just as the moon can affect the psychological and physical state of some people, Mars's unexpected visit is causing people to behave pretty strangely. Every night, the sky is lit up by the white light of the moon and the red glow of Mars. Many people get a sort of instant insomnia. Some even stop drinking coffee because they no longer feel sleepy. Mars brings out energy and a little wildness in people, (laughs) making them laugh more and even drives a few poor people crazy. They begin to go out of their houses more often and enjoy the unusual night sky. A few days later, everybody can see what's happening. Mars is getting bigger. Scientists announced that the red planet is slowly moving towards Earth. A collision is inevitable. 
Earthlings only have a few years left. A few months ago, a huge asteroid crashed into the red planet with such force that Mars simply flew out of its own orbit and went rogue. The chance that Mars would fly close to Earth was always going to be pretty high. After about 3 seconds of being announced, the news went viral, and panic set in. The situation's getting worse and worse. The closer Mars gets, the more it affects people on a physical level. Hundreds of videos pop up showing collision simulations of Mars and Earth. And there's no happy ending. Want to see what happens? One famous blogger asked her followers. The Earth's almost completely covered with water, and Mars is all dust, sand, and rocks. Then she puts a huge watermelon in the middle of her room. From the far end, she launches a bowling ball at it. Strike! Mars looks almost the same size as the Moon now. It's about to come into the Moon's orbit, and it's affecting the Earth's magnetic field. Floods, hurricanes, tsunamis, powerful thunderstorms – they go from bad to worse. Animals go crazy. Birds no longer migrate south. The polar northern lights appear in the Caribbean. The economy isn't handling the news that well. People stop showing up to work. Why wouldn't they? They just want to have fun and be with loved ones. There are enough resources on the planet to last until the catastrophe, so no one's even trying to fix the Earth's problems. Clothing, food, cars, yachts, whatever – everything loses its value and becomes free. Every day, huge street parties pop up all over the world. People decide to live their last months in peace and harmony. The global catastrophe is uniting humanity like never before. To go out with a bang, Earthlings team up to organize a huge rock concert. The red giant destroying our beautiful blue planet. Yeah, rock and roll's the perfect soundtrack. There's just enough time to eat, dance, party, and listen to good music. Huge stages are built all over the planet. It's every musician's last concert. During all that preparation, hope suddenly appears. Scientists have calculated all the events that'll occur when Mars crashes into Earth, and they have a simple plan. Luckily, humans had already planned on moving to Mars, so they already have been building spaceships for years. There's no time to get to another planet before the collision. But the good news is that people can wait out the disaster just outside Earth's orbit. You get to sit in a space station, munch some popcorn, relax, and enjoy the show. When the dust settles, it might just be possible to return to Earth, or what's left of it. After learning about this plan, people start working on finishing the ships night and day. Everyone in the world pitches in. There are still two years left before the big day. The huge concert stages are converted into more space stations. Mars is now giving people more energy, and with epic teamwork, people manage to create thousands of stations in just a few months. That's what happens when 7 billion people work together. Farmers, physical therapists, chefs, engineers, athletes, accountants – all on the same team. Mars is now closer to us than the Moon. The red giant blocks out the sun and our planet is plunged into darkness. There are only a few days left. People are working like ants in a massive colony, putting the finishing touches on several hundred thousand space stations. It takes four whole days for everyone to get on board. Plus, there's the loading of supplies – animals, fish, seeds, plants, vegetables, fruits, video games, fruit roll-ups. The red giant is scheduled to enter Earth's orbit in a couple of days. That's when it will really pick up speed. Mars is only a little more than half the size of Earth, but up in the sky, it looks infinitely huge. The ships start taking off. People take a last look around, memorizing every inch. In a few hours, it'll all change forever. The stations fly up far enough away to clear any orbits. Two worlds colliding together should still have a soundtrack, though. Rock stars on every ship organize an outer space music festival. To the awesome sound of rock, Mars enters Earth's atmosphere and burns a thin layer of its own surface. This releases an incredible amount of energy. It gets faster and faster and smashes into the Pacific Ocean. A huge blast wave sweeps across the entire planet. 
Everything is lit up by flames, and everyone on the ships has to put on sunglasses to avoid being blinded. Our blue planet is turning into a fiery one. The dust of Mars mixes with the water of Earth. The force of the impact goes through the Earth's crust into the liquid-hot magma. Hundreds of pieces of Mars, some the size of entire countries, are somehow floating in the atmosphere. The collision generates so much energy that all oceans boil and evaporate. Seas and rivers of molten metal are now spreading all over Earth. Days, weeks, months pass. A belt made up of bits of Mars forms around the Earth. It's like a fiery version of Saturn. It'll take a long time before it's safe to land back down. But humanity can't stay alive on the ships all that time. Food, water, and oxygen will run out after a few years. But scientists already have a plan. The ships flip a switch and become huge cryo chambers. The ships are equipped with energy panels, and the roasting hot Earth's giving off a lot of energy. Totally enough to keep the ships working while everyone on board takes a few thousand year nap. As soon as the planet cools down, humans will wake up. Hundreds of thousands of years pass. One day, alarms go off simultaneously on all the ships. People wake up, slowly. Their bodies are exhausted, but after a few billion cups of coffee, everyone's ready to go. Down on Earth, new continents should have formed, and the atmosphere is most likely way different. The planet might have lost its original orbit, so it might be spinning at a different angle. The seasons as we know them, gone. All the water on Earth evaporated in the first few hours. But there were huge glaciers on Mars, which might have melted on impact. Mars may have shared its water with our planet. The clouds of dust and dirt should have settled by now, and the ground should be pretty good for growing stuff on. All that magma probably spewed up a bunch of useful minerals and chemicals. It's going to be difficult, but humanity somehow must adapt to the new Earth. People are ready for anything. All the Earthlings run to the nearest windows to see what their beloved planet looks like after all these centuries. Um, where is it? People are craning their necks, looking out at the empty spot where the Earth used to be. The impact of Mars was so strong that it pushed the Earth out of its orbit around the Sun. It's gone. Great. What are we gonna do now? Some bearded guy grabs a guitar and says, Let's play!